So there are three steps to distribute the key. The aim, the aim is that A and B know the session key. And that happens after step three. Step four and five are just some extra checks. They're called the authentication steps to check really, B is checking with A, did you really send this message? So B sends back message four, which is, has the meaning, did you really send me message three? Or maybe someone else replayed it from before. And if A really did send message three, it will respond with message five. If A didn't send message three, it is an attack by some malicious user who replayed it. That is, it was sent before by, by user A, but some malicious user intercepted and at a later time replayed that. Then when A receives message four, it detects something's gone wrong. If I didn't send message three, but I received message four, then something's gone wrong and they'll take other steps to make sure that B is informed or they will not continue so that they will not use this session key. Similar, if B does not receive message five, then it assumes something's gone wrong. And also, what's inside message four and five? Message four contains a nonce value generated by B, N2 in this case. So another, for example, random number, a different random number. B chooses a large random number encrypts it with KS, the session key, only A should be able to decrypt. A malicious user should not be able to decrypt and find the nonce value. And they should not be able to guess the nonce value because if it's a large random number, it would take too long to guess. So you very, uh, there's no, no practical chance to guess it. So if a malicious user did send message three and receive message four and they try to respond with message five, then they cannot send message five because they don't know the session key and they don't know the nonce value. Message five, it says here f of n2, a function of n2. It can be any function, a simple function like increment by one. So b chooses a large random number and to check that it really did come from a, then A sends back some modification of that large random number. For example, that large random number plus one. If B doesn't get that correct modified number in a response, then it assumes something went wrong. So these are just to check that uh, an attacker doesn't replay a message. Note that the KDC doesn't send the session key direct to B in this case. It doesn't need to. To cut down on messages, there's one message to KDC saying, I want a session key to B. KDC responds, here it is. Here's the session key. And A forwards on the part of that message that contains the session key that B can decrypt. So as a, as a result of message three being received, B has KS. And previously from message two, A has KS. They have the session key. When A now sends data to B, so after step five, everything's done, they start sending data, they encrypt with what? What do they encrypt their data with? Which key? Which key? Now they're sending data. What key are they going to use? They use the session key. So remember, the session key, session means your communication session. For example, you're downloading a file from a web server. So the session is that duration of that TCP connection while you're transferring data. Or maybe if this is, for example, for voice communications, the session may be for a voice call. A session can be defined different ways, but it's usually for some, uh, some group of communications can be multiple messages. Maybe we use it today, this session key, and tomorrow if I want to communicate with B again, I may follow these steps again and get a new session key because it's, it's a, an advantage to keep changing your session keys, keep changing your keys. Same as you change your passwords on your accounts on a regular basis, 
you change your PIN number, your PIN for your, your ATM, you change, well not everyone changed, there's that home lock, but the idea is that if you change the key that there's less opportunity for the attacker to find that key. So this uses the KDC. When A sends data to B using the session key to encrypt, note that KDC can see the data. It's possible for the KDC to encrypt, uh, sorry, to intercept any message sent from A to B. If it's encrypted with a session key, the KDC can decrypt that. Because it was the KDC that generated the session key. The KDC knows KS. So A, B and the KDC know KS. And therefore we must trust the KDC not to make use of that data. So that's where we say it's a trusted third party. That's the notation that was used. So this approach involves, we need this other server type entity in the network, a KDC. So let's say uh, all the computers in SIT's LAN, all the desktop PCs at least, in the office, offices, in the labs, we wanted to use encryption between all of them. Then we'd have some special server that acts as the KDC. And there'll be a master key programmed into each computer shared with the KDC. And then there'll be a protocol that when one computer wants to communicate with another, the first one contacts the KDC, the KD across the LAN, the KDC sends a session key and that first computer then forwards that session key onto the destination computer. And then the two computers send their data securely between each other using the session key to encrypt. So we need some server or this, this uh, KDC in the network. In large networks, you can have a hierarchy of KDCs because, let's say, a large network, SIT's network, we have two campuses. We have one KDC in this campus, a second one in the other campus to serve the users in that campus, and we can have, in fact, the two KDCs can uh, obtain and distribute master keys via a, a top level KDC so we can have some hierarchy of KDCs that help in distributing the keys. So one for each LAN or building and then a central one to exchange keys between hosts in different subnets. And as you get larger you can have for performance reasons multiple KDCs. And having multiple KDCs also uh, spreads uh, the effort around. Uh, it means that one KDC doesn't become a performance bottleneck and also means if one KDC is compromised, then the others are not. Okay? Compromised if, if someone can get access to this KDC, a malicious user, then they can find all the master keys and all the session keys. The, the, the the security of our system fails. So we must keep the KDC secure, usually physically secure if it's a server, because that's a, a key point of the network. So having multiple KDCs means that if, for example, the KDC in Rungsit is compromised, someone gets access to it, at least it means the communications in this campus can still be secure so long as the KDC here is secure. Okay. So there's advantages of having multiple KDCs. So a hierarchy of KDCs. Another concept, how long should we use the session key for? Every time we want a new session key, we must go through this step, these five steps. There's some communication overhead. So every time my computer wants a session key with another computer, we go through these steps. We send some message to the KDC, get a response. If I want to change session keys, then we go through these steps again. So there's a trade-off here. 
you want to change your session key as often as possible for security because the, the fewer times you use the key, it gives less opportunity for the attacker to discover the key. So you want to change as often as possible. But the more times you change, the more communications overhead of implementing this protocol. So there's some trade-off there. Shorter lifetime of the session key, the more secure, but the more overhead of the communications, the more impact on performance. So when in practice do you change the session key? It depends on the application on, on the network. Some examples are you change, you could have a, a session key for each TCP connection. Every time you connect, you establish a TCP connection from client to server, for that connection get a new session key. That's one example. Or you could do it on a time basis. Every day get a new session key. Or every five minutes get a new session key. The more often, the more secure. So depending upon your applications and what your security requirements are, you can have a scheme to change session keys. Using a KDC has a big disadvantage. You must trust the KDC. So it's OK in an organization, that is, all the users in SIT, all the employees, for communicating securely inside SIT, we need to be able to trust the computer center who runs the KDC. That's OK, because we all work for the same organization. We must trust each other. But what if you are in a, uh, a circumstance where you do not want to trust some central third party. The two entities want to communicate securely, but they don't want someone else to know their key. Because again, the KDC knows the session key. So you can very modify the scheme to be a decentralized approach. There's no KDC involved. So a, a protocol for exchanging uh, session keys the end result, A and B have a session key, KS. The big difference here is that for this to work, each user must exchange a master key with each other user. So in this example, there's a master key, KM, shared between A and B, okay. manually delivered in the past. And if A wants to communicate with C using this same approach, there must be some master key exchanged between them. And then they use this protocol to exchange a session key. So in this case, there are many more master keys. That's the problem with a decentralized approach. Every user ex exchanges a master key using manual delivery with every other user. And we get, we no longer have it our n by n minus 1 divided by two master keys, many master keys. Whereas in our centralized approach, we need one master key for every user, n master keys. Whereas with decentralized, we need n by n minus 1 over 2, approximately or in the order of n squared master keys. So that's the problem with a decentralized approach. If you don't want to use the KDC, you need many master keys. You may ask, well, if we already have a master key, then why, use a, why perform this protocol? If A has a master key with the, which they've shared with B, why do we need to do this? What's the advantage? So this scheme assumes A and B all already know KM, the master key. So why perform these steps? So we can change the key that we use to encrypt our data frequently. So this assumes A knows KM and B knows KM. Let's write it down.
This de decentralized scheme assumes that A and B have already shared a master key, KM. Then they follow these three steps and the result is that they both have a session key. A and B share a session key, KS. Then when they want to send data, they encrypt using the session key. Why not not do these three steps and just encrypt our data with the master key? Well, it's this concept of we want to be able to change our keys on a regular basis. Let's say we've got uh, a million packets to send, right? a million pieces of data. Let's put some numbers to it. A million packets to send between A and B. If we don't use this scheme and A and B have some master key and we encrypt all of our data using that master key, then we can think of those one million packets, we've encrypted all of them using our master key. So we've, let's say we've used our master key one million times. Now, by using this scheme, A and B share a master key, but then they use that to generate a session key, then what they do is that they encrypt their data with the session key. Let's say we use a session key for just 1,000 packets and after encrypting 1,000 packets we change session keys and then encrypt the next 1,000 packets and then change session keys again. Then with session key 1, the first one, we'd encrypt 1,000 packets and then we'd repeat this these three steps and get a new session key, session key 2, and encrypt a thousand packets and we do that a thousand times, KS1000. Why a thousand? Because we have a million packets in total to encrypt. So just put some numbers to it so we can compare. How many messages using this approach, how many messages were encrypted with the master key? So what we do is we have a master key. Every time we want a new session key we apply this protocol. One of these messages, message 2, we encrypt using the master key. You see 1 and 3 we do not. So we use the master key just one time in this case we use it one time when we, ch every time we change session keys we use the master key once. So the total number of times we send something across the network using the master key in this example is a thousand times. One for each time we change the session key. The result is by using this scheme we use the master key on total one thousand times we use session key 1 1,000 times, session key 2 1,000 times, and so on. The less times we use a key, the harder it is for the attacker to try and discover that key. If we didn't use session keys, we use the master key 1 million times. By using the session key, we use the master key just 1,000 times in this simplistic example. That is, we use it much less than in this case. So that's why we'd consider this more secure. So yes, using the master key allows us to change session keys. But the problem with this approach, we must manually deliver master keys between each pair of users. So only very useful for small networks. Before we move on, any questions about these schemes? The KDC and the decentralized approach. So those approaches were about getting a, a session key between A and B and then they used symmetric key encryption to encrypt their data. And the way that we got that session key securely was we encrypted with a master key also using symmetric key encryption. 
That is, the E in here is using symmetric key encryption. AES, triple DES, whatever. Let's consider a different approach. The goal now is to distribute a shared secret key, same as before, but to do that we will use asymmetric encryption, that is public key cryptography. And we'll go through three different schemes for how to do that. Or we'll go through two, one's just a combination. The, remember that with public key cryptography or asymmetric encryption, we generally don't want to use it to encrypt all of our data. So the idea is for the data we send between A and B, use symmetric encryption. You only use asymmetric encryption when you have a small amount of information to send because it's too slow otherwise. So as you saw in your assignment, one way to use asymmetric encryption is to exchange secrets, exchange secret keys. Let's go through some examples. One of them you've seen is Diffie-Hellman, but let's go through some other ones. Here's a very simple one. A sends its public key to B and its identity, saying, I am user A, here is my public key, and B selects or generates a session key, KS, and encrypts that session key with the public key of A. Sends it back to A, and now B has the session key, B selected it, and A can decrypt this message because A has its own private key. No one else can decrypt this message because no one else has the private key A, and therefore the session key has been received by A and not no one else. So this is a very simple way for A and B to get the shared session key KS. It provides confidentiality for the session key. It relies on public key cryptography. This encrypt here, this E, we're using something like RSA. Using the public key of A to encrypt and you know if you use, if B uses A's public key to encrypt then only A can decrypt because only A has the corresponding private key. So only A can decrypt and discover KS. Simple. See if you can attack it. There's a simple, what's called man in the middle attack that can be performed in this case. Try and work it out. You're the man in the middle between A and B. See how you can defeat this system. Not a meat in the middle attack that we saw with double death. This is a man in the middle attack. Give you five minutes to see if you can break this system. So what you can try and think about is, okay, if you were C in the middle and you could intercept these messages, what could you do to fool A and B into thinking they have a session key that's secret? See if you can defeat this system. So one way to do it is start drawing a diagram where you have A, C and B and send some messages. be a bonus for the first person who can show me the correct answer before I draw it on the screen or on the board. Come on, now use your brains and start performing an attack. Not correct yet. So think you're the, or there's an entity in the middle, entity C, for example. What can they do?
sounds on the right track, draw the picture. <laughs> Any attempts? Any solutions? People are on the right track? On the right track? Hint, there should be, there'll be four messages at the end. First person to draw on the board will get the bonus. Bonus. Bonus for the next quiz, the next in class quiz. Next or the last one? If you get it wrong, you get a penalty. No, no, no. no. Is he correct? Is he correct? Does it work? Have a look. See w why or what happens when this man in the middle, M, sends this second message. Think about what, what has this achieved? And so there's a question, should this be IDA or IDM? It should be IDA because M is pretending to be A. That's the idea, masquerade. So let's see if it works. And I think I don't even have to draw it because I think what you've got is correct, isn't it? So the idea is that A and B need to get a session key, KS. And their, their goal is that no one else knows the session key. What the man in the middle attack does is that this man C intercepts the messages and tries to do something such that C also knows the session key and A and B don't know that anything's gone wrong. That's important, that A and B think everything's gone correctly. Because if they detect something's gone wrong, then they will not use that session key. 
So A sends its, as shown, A sends its a normal original message, the public key, its own public key, and its identity. So that's the original message. And the man in the middle then pretends to be A. And the way that it pretends to be A is sends the identity of A, but sends a fake public key. So we see here the identity of A and a fake public key. That is the public key of this man in the middle. So I'll copy your diagram and I've just called mine C. So it's still the identity of A. So B thinks it comes from A, but the public key has changed. I call it public key of C. B uses its own public key. Uh, sorry, C uses its own public key. The man in the middle uses their own public key. So B has received a request, really. According to the protocol, B receives a request. This is from A. Here's the public key. Generate a session key, encrypt it, and send it back. Using the normal protocol, when B receives such request, it encrypts with the public key it received and sends back the encrypted session key. So, B responds, not knowing it's from C, thinking it's from A. And we encrypt using the public key of C in this case, this public key we received, the chosen session key, KS. Leave, your leave it on the board. Okay. <laughs> so B chooses KS, the session key that it's going to use with A, and encrypts it using the public key that it received from A. Well, at least the public key that it thinks it received from A, but in fact it's C's public key. What does C do? C decrypts because C knows the C knows the private key. So it decrypts and when it decrypts it gets KS. So C knows KS. And now to make sure that A and B think nothing went wrong, C sends a message to A encrypting using the public key of who? Of A. Okay. The public key of A is known, so we encrypt using the public key of A. The same KS, not a different one. So when A receives this, he thinks, oh, everything's okay. I will decrypt with my private key and I'll get KS. And the end result, A has KS and B have, has KS. That's good from A and B's perspective. And nothing's gone wrong from A and B's perspective. Nothing they can detect. Because A sent the expected message and received the expected reply. That is, some key encrypted with A's public key. Because it successfully decrypts with A's private key, they trust this received message. Similar, B receives a request, identity and public key, encrypts with the public key, the session key. So A and B don't know anything's gone wrong. The man in the middle now knows the session key. So what happens next is A has some data to send to B, A encrypts that data with KS. So now A takes some data, encrypts it with KS, the session key, sends the data encrypted with KS to B. B receives it, but at the same time C takes a copy and decrypts it. Okay? Because C has KS, now anything sent between A and B encrypted with KS 
C also receives. And A and B don't know. Okay? Okay, so what about B receiving this message? The public key of C concatenated with ID of A. Uh, you, in your assignment, you saw they were Diffie-Hellman public keys. If you remember, in the assignment, one, one step was to generate your public key. And there were two values that, uh, in the public key. Let's see if I've got one. To show you an example, uh, whose public key can I show you? Uh, let me find an example public key. C here. So here's a public key. So when B receives this public key as well as the identity of A, all right, this is a Diffie Hellman public key, it can be any other type of public key. How do you know whose user this is? If you look at this, there's no information in there that says whose it is. So when you receive this public key, okay, between the begin public key and the end public key, when you receive that, there's no information in there identifying who it is. It's the ID that identifies who it is. So there's no way to, just, to know, is this really A's public key or is it C's public key? When B receives this message, it, doesn't, it cannot tell, it just takes the identity, okay, since the identity is A, then let's assume that the public key is that, is, is that of A. And that's the weakness in this scheme, that B cannot confirm that this public key is in fact someone else's. So B does not detect anything went wrong there. So in this case, this says the public key of Steve, but in fact, it is not my key. You, if you look at them, they're identical. In fact, just because the file name says Steve, it's someone else's public key in this case. Okay? So there's no way by just looking at the public key to know whose it actually is. And that's the problem with distributing public keys. We need some other way to confirm that this is in fact this user's public key. It's not something else, someone else saying it's a user's public key, but it's in fact pretending to be, oh, that it's someone else's public key. So this, in this case, was one user saying, here's Steve's public key, but in fact it wasn't my public key, it was another user's public key, pretending to be me. So this simple scheme for key distribution does not work if we can have a man in the middle who can intercept and, and generate messages. It's only useful if there's no opportunity for an attacker to intercept and modify messages. So if an attacker cannot insert messages, then this scheme works fine. But if an attacker can in, intercept, modify messages, then it's insecure. When may they not be able to? Maybe the link. If the link is secure, it's an optical fiber link, 
and there's no way for them to uh, create new messages on that link, then it's impossible for them to attack this scheme. So it's okay in some cases, but not all. Across the internet, not good, because here's my computer, here's the Facebook web server. All someone has to do is get access to some ISP somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the internet, intercept the message and modify the message and they can attack this scheme. A modification or an alternative scheme. Uh, will we go through it? I think you can study this one in your own time. It's just an alternative scheme, also using public keys. Uh, there are others as well. Okay. Um, I want to get on to the next topic. This one's about done. Diffie-Hellman, we saw, was another way to use public keys to exchange secrets. So we saw that in your assignment. Uh, there's not much to say about this one. Uh, maybe the only thing to point out in this one, we provide some form of authentication. We encrypt with a private key and a public key. Encrypting with a private key, remember, is signing something. Uh, so in this scheme that uses both signing and also uh, encryption or confidentiality. Again, this one assumes that the public keys are known and correct. So we see A encrypts with the public key of B. Of course, A must know the public key of B in this case. So there's some assumption about what's known prior for this working. Other ways for distributing symmetric keys is combined with a KDC. So So you can use a combination of the KDC for secret key distribution and also the public key distribution. So we saw with the KDC, we assume the master keys were distributed manually. An alternative, an, an alternative to that is to use public key encryption. So to distribute the master keys, use public key encryption using one of the schemes that we've seen. And we'll see later some issues with key distribution of public keys. So the mainly that simple one and the man in the, man in the middle attack is what I wanted to cover on, on those alternatives. Let's introduce the next topic and then show a few examples and then next week we'll finish on, on the next topic. This is now different. The previous approaches were about getting a shared secret to the other side. Now we have this problem of how do we get public keys to the other person? And we just saw a problem. We saw the problem that user B received a message with the public key and they didn't know whose public key it was. They just assumed since it came with ID A, it must be A's public key. And that was the flaw in this uh, key distribution scheme. That's why it didn't work because B received a public key and there was no way to be sure that it was in fact A's public key or M's public key. So distributing public keys is not easy because anyone can send out a public key and say this is Steve's public key. So we need some extra mechanisms. We'll go through and look at some general approaches and then some specific protocols for doing it. So by design, public keys are made public. Everyone can know them. But we have this issue. How do we ensure that a public key of A actually belongs to A and not someone pretending to be A? That's what we had the problem here. Different approaches, and some of them are related. Public announcement, post your public key on a website, on a bulletin board or print it out and put it, stick it on your door of your office, whatever, but somehow announce your public key. 
uh, or have some directory, some server that stores public keys. And when you want someone else's public key, you contact that directory, that server, and it gives you the public key of another user. And then we'll see some, some protocols related to those two. Public announcements, so, okay, at the end of your email, you include your public key, the, like the value that I showed for your Diffie-Hellman public key. You include this text at the end of your email, or you include it on a web page or in some forum, and then people know your public key. It works, except as we know, how do we be sure that the public key being announced is actually for that user? It's not someone pretending to be that user. Well, okay, you may say, if you receive an email from Steve at sit.tuact.h and it's got a public key, then you know it must be my public key. But I think we saw in one of the earlier lectures that it's very easy to fake an email address. So you can receive an email that looks like it's from Steve at SIT, but it's actually from some student, and it's got a public key. You think it's Steve's, but it's in fact someone else's. So we need some way to, to be sure that it's a user's public key. Just making public announces, announcements uh, not enough. You could have some form of directory to automate this process. You have a, a server, and again, each user who has a public key publishes this, their key in some server. And when you want another user's public key, you contact that server and download their key. Now this will work if, if the users, when they publish their key, provide some form of identification. Okay. Let's say this is some special web server. It's run by me, and all the students need to provide their public key. So what you do is you come to my office, you show me your student ID, I check your photo. OK, I'm, I confirm this is actually you, and this is your correct public, uh, public key. So if there's some identification when the key is published in the directory, then when someone receives the key, they are sure that it is the correct key. So we need some way to ID the correct users. Of course, we need to make sure that the directory cannot be compromised, that someone cannot put in a public key that is a fake or uh, for some other user. How can we automate this process? What protocol can we use to publish and obtain public keys of other users? That's what we're going to cover in these two slides. We'll just introduce I think one of them. So here's a way that we have users that want to communicate and to communicate they need to know each other's public key. So B wants to know the public key of A and similar A wants to know the public key of B. In this case, we have this, this directory. It's here, it's called a public key authority. It's a case of a publicly available directory. And this protocol assumes that user A has published their key with the authority. So the authority has a list of keys. And then the protocol shows how do we obtain other users' keys. Let's go through it. So the assumption before any of these step, steps happen is that A has gone to the authority and saying, I am user A and here is my public key. So let's take a record of who knows which keys. At the start, A knows its own public key. and its own, all right, we use lowercase a and b. A knows its own public key and private key. Every user knows their own key pair, same as user b. B 
Beano's PUB and PRB, and also the authority has a key pair. So everyone has their own key pair in this protocol. And also, we assume, <coughs> so we assume that each user has published their public key at the authority. What that means is that A has gone to the authority and said, here is my public key. And we trust that. So there's been some form of identification taking place there. So the authority also knows PUA and PUB. And finally, when you go to the authority and say, here's my public key, at the same time, the authority gives you their public key. So user A knows the public key of the authority, and so does user B. This is the assumption at the start of this scheme. The aim is for A and B to get each other's public key and to do it securely so they know for sure it is when B receives a public key that this is A's public key and same for user A. And it's quite simple to get started. What happens is, let's say A wants to communicate with B. So A will need to know B's public key. So A sends a request to the authority saying, I want B's public key, some form of request. And here we have some new notation. T1 is a timestamp. Similar to our nonce before, it's used to identify this request. A different request at a different time would have a different value of the timestamp. So A sends a request saying, I need to know uh, the public key of B. So inside this request would be identifying A and B the authority looks for the public key of B and sends it back to A. But importantly, the public key of B, which comes back to A, is signed by the authority. When I say signed, I mean encrypted with the private key of the authority. Recall when we encrypt with a private key, anyone can decrypt, but it's a confirmation that it came from that user. So A requests B's public key in step one. In step two, the public key authority sends back B's public key because the authority has it. It's stored in the directory. And importantly, they sign it using their private key. When A receives message 2, they verify the signature. How do they verify it? How does user A verify the message 2? Using the, using the public key of the authority. Good. Because it's encrypted with the private key of the authority that is signed by the authority, when we receive it, we decrypt so A decrypts using the public key of the authority, which they already have, and they trust. And if it successfully decrypts, then it means it must have been encrypted with a private key of the authority, which means it must have came from the authority. It didn't come from someone pretending to be the authority. That's the purpose of this signature. It's not from some malicious user saying, here's the public key of B. Well we must trust that the message we receive in fact is the public key of B and we do that using the signature. A has now the public key of B and they know it's B's public key because they, it was signed by the authority and they trust the authority. The next step, step three, because A wants to communicate with B, they send a message to B uh, confidential message encrypted with B's public key 
saying, I am user A and I want to communicate with you. And then B does, similar to what A did, requests A's public key and the authority sends B the public key of A. So steps four and five are almost identical to steps one and two, except they're from B to the authority instead of A to the authority. And after step five, B knows the public key of A. So after step after step two, A knows the public key of B. And after step five, B knows the public key of A. And they trust them because they were signed by the authority and we trust the authority in the in the system. And Similar to what we saw in the KDC, we have some final messages to prevent replay attacks, some final authentication. We see, again, sending nonce values and responding with nonce values just to confirm this message actually came from you. It's not someone else replaying that message. So this is a way for using an authority to discover other users' public key and be sure that that public key is of the correct user. Fifteen minutes to go, we're okay. Any questions on how we use an authority? So think of this, for example, I'm the authority. You come to me, you show me your ID, you show me your public key, I store your public key, and every student does that. I store every student's public key. So that happens at the start. And at the same time, when you come to my office, I also give you my public key. I'm the authority. So every student knows their own key pair and the authority's public key. That's the setup of the system. Now when two students want to communicate, they need each other's public key. And because you don't trust other students, what you do is you contact me first. You say, I want student B's public key. I give you student B's public key. And importantly, I sign that message. So you're sure it came from me. You contact the other student saying I want to communicate with you. That triggers them to contact me, the authority, asking for user A's public key. And I give the student user A's public key signed by me. And because you trust me, anything signed by me, you trust the content. What we'll do next week is go through an alternative. Provides similar features, but it performs better. That is, it's more practical, practical to use in a large network. And it's certificates. And this is what's used in the internet when you access secure web servers, a digital certificate. So we'll spend some time going through how we use a certificate, what is a certificate, what do they look like, and what your web browser, how they store them and manage certificates. Let's do that next week. Uh, we'll stop there. And <laughs> what, what, you'll do, what you'll do is so that you can be up to speed next week, so we can go straight into certificates. Make sure that you look at those these diagrams that we've gone through for KDC through to decentralized and finishing with this one. So given a quiz or given a exam question which 
normally gives you such a diagram. You're not expected to remember these diagrams, but given one such a diagram, answer questions about what's happening, what can go wrong. So understand the notation and what type of attacks may or may not be possible. Let's continue that next week. Enough for today. <laughs>